Hi, and welcome to this special episode of Consulting with Authority. This is your host, Scott Cantrell. Today, we're going to do things a little bit different. I've gone through my archives and inventory of literally hundreds of different presentations that I've given over the years and identified one that I honestly probably should have released on the podcast before now, but uh, better late than never, I suppose. The name of the presentation today is The Authority Advantage. This is a kind of my flagship or signature presentation, and it reveals a lot of the different strategies and tactics that I certainly use myself to keep my business on a trajectory of growth. And also, it's the same tactics and strategies that I share with my clients and help them implement to be more successful in their own businesses. So I know you'll find a lot of value today. Enjoy this special episode of Consulting with Authority, my presentation of The Authority Advantage. Welcome to The Authority Advantage. This is Scott Cantrell. I'm really excited that you've joined us for today. We're going to be going through a lot of information, so I want to make sure that you all have something to take notes with. Um, I don't mind if you occasionally uh, grab a picture with your cell phone of the slides. I will try to make those available uh, to everyone who's registered as well. Today, we're going to be talking about a simple system to attract your ideal prospects, access key decision makers, and acquire larger clients. Again, my name is Scott Cantrell from Smart Solutions Media, and I just want us to go ahead and dive in to the session today. Um, if you are here and don't want one or more of the things on the screen and you're not a consultant or an advisor, this may not be the right place for you. However, if you are a consultant or advisor and you want to lower your own stress level, you want to convert prospects into clients faster and easier, you want to have more, better clients, you want to have a higher level of revenue and profitability with your firm, and perhaps the most important thing, it is true for me, it's true for a lot of my clients and the people that I work with, you want to have maximum impact. You got involved in the business. You created the business that you're running and you're operating because you wanted to impact people and change people's lives and people's businesses for the better. And so today's presentation is designed to help you get some tools and knowledge and expertise that will help you achieve all five of those results, beginning with maximizing impact. And one of the companies that I'm proud to partner with and work directly with is called New Orchard. We're going to be talking about something very, very special that they've recently released to the marketplace for consultants and advisors a little bit later on. But I just wanted to uh, let you know how special New Orchard is. The work that they're doing is fantastic, and they truly understand what it takes to be a talented and skillful and successful consultant and advisor in today's world. They're doing all they can to help people like me and my consultant clients and you uh, perform at a higher level and impact our clients at a higher level. For those of you who don't know who I am, uh, again, this is Scott Cantrell. My company is Smart Solutions Media, and we work with consultants and advisors and independent professionals to help them develop and sustain a competitive advantage and dominate the marketplace. Just in the last 15 years or so, the education and solutions that I've been taking to the market have helped my clients generate more than $100 million of additional revenue, and those are businesses across the United States. Now, I share that to... Uh, I'm obviously very proud of it, but I don't share that to to brag. I share that to simply say what you're going to be learning here works. It's not a question of whether it works or not. Is it working for other people? Is it theoretical? Has it been tried in, in the real world? The answer is yes, it has. Yes, it works. Yes, it works for myself and my clients. And yes, when it's uh, adopted by you and adapted for your own business, it will work for you too. So here's my promise for today. I want to share with you a proven top model for consultants that I've been uh, sharing with them for many, many years. It's designed to help you accelerate your business uh, success, your business development, and help you transform prospects into lifelong clients without resistance. I realize that's a big promise, and I'm going to do everything I can to fulfill it. Um, all I need from you is just your attention. Uh, if there's distractions around you, make sure to minimize those. You know, Turn your phone on silent or vibrate. Make sure the door to your office is closed. Because I do want you to be solely focused on what we're going over today because everything that we're touching on today builds on the item before it. We're going to be talking about a number of strategies and then some stuff, uh, some really cool solutions uh, at the end. And everything builds on everything else. So I don't want you to miss one of those key pieces to the puzzle. 
As we begin here, I want to talk to you about a concept called the authority advantage matrix. And you can see the matrix there on the screen. It's simply a two by two matrix with the ability to communicate your expertise across the horizontal axis and your actual expertise on the vertical axis. The question is, where are you? So working with independent advisors and consultants primarily, that's primarily who I serve and I work with them to help them grow their business and attract more clients faster and easier. I begin with this. And if I can understand where my client is as a consultant, then I know how I can help them because we all want to move and we all want to stay in the upper right quadrant, the sustained success quadrant. That's where we want to be. And ultimately, our ability to stay or get to that quadrant is determined by how much authority we have in the marketplace. And when I say authority, I'm not talking about control over someone or the ability to tell somebody what to do. What I'm talking about is a position that you own in the marketplace where your prospects see you as the expert. They see you as an authority on your topic, your subject matter, whatever it may be. You want to own that place of authority in your marketplace so people will be naturally attracted to do business with you as opposed to you having to chase them down and trying to convince them that it's a good idea for them to do business with you. So the question is, how do we move into that upper right quadrant? Well, it's very clear on the screen there, right? We have to have a high level of expertise. The higher level of expertise, the better. We also want to be able to clearly and articulately and consistently communicate our expertise effectively to our target market. Because if we can't do that, if, if, if we're not able to communicate with them effectively about who we are and our expertise then they're never going to perceive us as that authority that we want them to perceive us as. So today, we're not going to spend so much time on the vertical axis. I'm going to trust that if you're here today and you're, you have uh, the role of consultant or advisor or professional service provider, that you have a high level of expertise. I'm going to assume that you already have a solution or skill set or service that is worth uh, you selling, worth someone else buying from you. We're going to make that assumption for today. What I won't assume is that you are communicating your expertise as efficiently and effectively as you would like into the market, and that's where we're going to focus our efforts today. But I want you to look at that, and um, for most of you, you will have a high level of expertise. So every day that goes by that you're not actively and proactively communicating that to the market, that's lost opportunity. And I want to move you to the right so that you can have sustained success. Let's begin with a big idea. When you have a method and structured process for truly cultivating a new prospect, sales stress and resistance will be virtually eliminated. Your sales cycle will shorten, your conversion rate will increase, and turning prospects into clients will be fun again. Now, I don't know about you, but when I got started uh, as a consultant many, many, many years ago, uh, finding new clients and trying to create new opportunities was not the most fun thing in the world. <laughs> not really at all. I can tell you ever since I've had a, a concise and clear and simplified process for identifying, accessing, and engaging new potential opportunities, all of those results that I just described that are there on the screen have come true. Now, does that mean it's perfect? No, I don't think there's such a thing as a perfect sales process or a perfect prospecting or lead generation methodology. There's no such thing. We're always trying to enhance and amplify and maximize. What I'm going to give you today are some key foundational strategies and tactics that you can use to improve these results for yourself. So a question that I get, and we've addressed it before, I won't spend a lot of time here, but it is worth reiterating. Do these strategies work? Yes, <laughs> that's the simple point. Uh, they were developed nearly 20 years ago, at least in some form, they existed about 20 years ago. Obviously, they've gone through a lot of iteration. Uh, they've been refined, and they've been demonstrated also in multiple industries. 
So, you know, whether you're a consultant for manufacturing or a consultant for insurance or a business development consultant or whatever uh, different uh, financial advisor or professional service provider in some way, these strategies will serve you well. Um, they're designed to accelerate the sales process by simplifying complex sales. So if you're if you are selling something that's not just commoditized or if you're trying to decommoditize something that has been commoditized and you're trying to compete against um, really tough competitors that are competing against one another on price and you're trying to set yourself apart, then these strategies will work for you. Uh, helps you maximize the conversion rate as well. And the last thing I'll mention is these strategies are the same ones that I and my clients have used to produce both surges of business as well as a steady flow of new opportunities. And this has worked especially well during chaos and disruption. In fact, uh, many of these strategies were born during times of chaos or disruption when there was some level of uncertainty. But they work in normal times and they work in, in chaotic times just as well. Today, this is what we're going to go over. We're going to be talking about four different strategies, and then I'm going to share with you a shortcut. And you definitely want to hang on to the shortcut. Um, I'm using this shortcut now. I'm sharing it with my clients, and I want to share it with you as well. You need to be aware of it, just like you need to be aware of the four strategies. Um, I won't read those to you. That's where we're headed today. Let's jump into strategy one. Strategy one is about giving leaders what they want the most. And there are three results, three, just three results that your key decision maker prospects want the most. They may not articulate them. They may not tell you these are the three things I want. They may describe other things that they want that are also important, other objectives and goals and metrics they want to achieve. And that's all great. But at the end of the day, if you can provide the three results we're going to talk about and you can communicate how you're going to provide these three results to a prospect, you're going to have a much higher likelihood of that prospect becoming a client faster and easier. This is about understanding the outcomes that your prospects really need and the, pros uh, the outcomes that they really want. So um, what is it that they desperately want and need? If, 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 I was in front of this group, uh, we were all live in a room, I might ask you to throw out some ideas um, and we would get all sorts of great answers that are not necessarily wrong, but there are three that I think that um, are more paramount, are bigger, more significant, more substantial than the others. And here's the first one, clarity. Your prospects are desperate for simplicity and clarity. That's what they want. Think about this for a second. Think about when you have a challenge or a problem or when you've identified an opportunity you want to you take advantage of. In any of those situations, what is the first necessary essential key to being able to solve a problem, overcome a challenge, or take advantage of an opportunity? There must be clarity. You must have a specific direction to achieve meaningful results. And the faster that you can get clarity about that problem and the solution or the challenge and how to overcome it or the opportunity and how to take advantage of it, the faster you can get clarity around those things, the more excited you are and the faster you can get the results, right? Same is true for your clients or your prospects in this case if they're not clients yet. You want to give your prospects specific direction and show them the way of how they can get results. The faster you can give them a plan that is simple and clear, the higher level of trust and authority you will have in their minds. The higher level of authority and trust you have in their minds, the more likely they are to do business with you. So clarity is the first result. Use the word clarity. <laughs> when you sit down with a prospect or you're talking with them on a screen share or on the phone, Use the word clarity. Listen, Mr. and Mrs. Prospect, if we don't do anything in our first 15 minutes together, my goal is to make sure that you and I both have crystal cl clarity around if or what the opportunities might be for us to work together. Or we have clarity around what the challenges or opportunities you face are. Or we have clarity around what, you know, you have clarity around what my value and solutions could be. 
Clarity is the first of the three. The second one is confidence. This may seem somewhat counterintuitive, right? I mean, Scott, why would my prospects want confidence? I mean, they're the one hiring me. Shouldn't I be the one that, that needs the confidence? Fair enough. Yes, you should also be confident. But what I'm saying is, is that your prospects and your clients have to have a strong belief in their ability to do the thing that you're asking them to do, to change the behavior, to make the investment, to make the new hire, to take the action, to execute the plan, whatever the thing is that you're asking them to do, they have to have a high enough level of belief in their own personal ability, in their team's ability, in their organization's ability to do that thing, to take that action, to take that step. So in this sense, it's your job to give them meaningful encouragement. There's a couple of ways to do this, right? You can cite past examples of organizations that you've worked with or individuals that you've worked with that are similar to them and tell those stories, right? Well, let me tell you about a story of someone who was similar to you or an organization that, you know, was in your same industry and what they did and the results that they got. You know, if they did it, there's no reason you couldn't do it. Right. So that meaningful encouragement and that social proof is critical to making sure that that prospect has a belief that whatever you're sharing with them will work for them and that they can do it. They have to have a belief that it will work for them and that they can do it. Third, control. At the end of the day, as a consultant, as an advisor, as a subject matter expert who is monetizing your service or your skill or your solutions, you have to be sure that you are empowering your prospects and, cons and clients with some level of control. They have to have a perception that they um, can and will take control when they engage with you. Control over what? Control over whatever it is that you're helping them work on, right? So if, if you're a, um, a recruitment consultant or a turnover consultant, then your focus is on helping them control their workforce and who leaves and who stays and all of those, those things, right? You want to be able to ideally give them new capability. So new capability means that they can now do something because of you and the work that you're doing. They can now do something successfully that they could not do before. When you can do something successfully that you could not do before, that means you have more control. When you have a skill set or you can achieve something you couldn't achieve before, that means you have a higher level of control. So your job as a consultant is to give them a new capability with your skills, your service, or your solutions. So consider what capabilities are you giving or are you providing or are you sharing with your clients when you work with them? If you will focus on these three things, clarity, confidence, and control in your prospect conversations, and you can even use the words, right? A lot of the phrases on the screens that we've been looking at here, you can use this language in your prospect conversations and people will understand it. They will appreciate it because at the end of the day, we all want and desperately need more clarity, confidence, and control. Your job is to simply show your prospects and clients how you're going to achieve those three things for them and with them. That brings us to strategy two. Strategy two is all about converting high value clients. And I know I'm going fast, <laughs> so I want you to hang on with me uh, and keep taking notes. We're just on strategy two. We're moving quick. Strategy two is about converting high value clients. So not all clients are created equal. I know that you know that, and it's a lesson that we all have to learn usually a lot more than once before we really get it. I want you to be targeting your highest value clients, the clients you most enjoy working with, the clients you can give the most value to and contribute the most value to, the ones that you can have the maximum maximum impact with. I also want you to be converting um, you know, prospects into clients that are going to pay you the most money, right? And usually where you can contribute the most value, that's where you're going to get compensated the most. So we want to be focused on how high value clients. If you're focused on low value clients, what I'm going to go through with you will be wasted on them. It won't matter. So um, 
I, I want you to keep that in mind. The question I often get is, Scott, I'd love to close the bigger accounts. I'd love to close the higher value accounts, but I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to differentiate myself. I don't know how to manage and choreograph the sales process in such a way that they decide to go with me as opposed to the bigger shop or the bigger, longer term, you know, uh, older consulting firm or the person they've been with forever. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. I'm going to show you that process. And ultimately, this is about leveraging the best method to establish authority and convert clients. So here's just a truth, uh, one that you probably know, one that we can all observe. Most consultants simply ignore or they overlook what happens between initial contact when you make initial contact with a prospect and actually converting that prospect to a client, them signing the agreement. We usually don't we're not as structured and strategic and as intentional and proactive as we should be in that middle phase. We're so excited about getting the initial contact, right? Our marketing worked. We got the initial contact. That's awesome. Now we just have to convert them to a client. And that's the quote unquote easy part. But we don't pay enough in attention to this part of the process. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to give you a framework that is incredibly valuable. It served me really well professionally. And you know what? This is not just about sales conversion. This is about actually delivering value to the prospect during the sales process. Not just after, but actually delivering meaningful value to the prospect during the process. It's four phases of advisory selling. And here's the big, the big shift, the big mental shift. Some of you may already be doing this, maybe even use this as a metaphor, but as we go through this process, I want you to think and act like a physician. I want you to think and act like a doctor does. You know, a doctor is an authority, right? A doctor is a consultant. A doctor is an advisor, usually very a very trusted one. So how did they get that? Was it just because they went to school for six to eight years and they got the degree? Well, that's a big part of it. You know, kudos, kudos to all my doctor friends and physicians who made that investment and are doing really, really important work. But the degree and the education is not the only thing that allows them to have authority and allows them to have that trusted advisor role. It's also how they behave and the process they use with their patients. And that process is key. And that process is one that we can use in our role as whatever type of consultant or advisor we are. That's the process we're going to talk about. The first step of the process, un un unsurprisingly, is discovery. And you probably already have a discovery step, regardless of what word you use or what you call it, you probably already have a discovery step in your process. Most consultants and advisors do. It may not be formalized. It may be something as simple as a 15 or 20 minute phone conversation, but it does exist. So think of this as this is the initial intake conversation that a doctor might have with a patient or uh, most often now that the nurse or the LPN would have with the patient when they first come in, right? They do the, the vitals check and a few simple questions and they mark that down. And then the doctor comes in and, you know, maybe continues that intake conversation, but moves to the next step. Discovery, this discovery step is all about, again, taking the vitals, taking the vitals of your prospect or the patient, right? Getting the key data, getting the key intelligence and information that you need in order to, to determine, is there even a reason why we should be talking? So the language I like to use in the discovery session, when I'm having my initial intake conversation with a prospect, I might say something like this. Hey, listen, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Prospect, I'm glad that we have an opportunity to, to talk today. Um, my goal for the next 15 to 20 minutes is really simple. It's just to determine if there's an overlap between where your problems and challenges or opportunities lie and where I have value and solutions. And if at the end of our conversation, it seems like there probably is a strong overlap, then it'll make sense for us to continue the conversation. Does that make sense to you? Is that fair? And that's it. That's how I start out my discovery conversation. So I've managed expectations. I've set the condition for the second meeting. 
And isn't that really what we both parties want to find out? Isn't that what both parties need to find out from the discovery session? So, yes, I'll ask them some questions. I'll let them ask me some questions. But I'm just trying to, again, take their temperature <laughs> uh, and get the vitals of where they are in, in, uh, in their business. I mean, what are they trying to achieve? What are their challenges, problems, opportunities? The second step of the process is diagnosis. So once a doctor has um, uh, once a doctor has done the initial intake, he or she starts formulating theories on what might be causing the problem, on you know why does your knee hurt, or why are you having chronic headaches, or you know why are you not able to sleep at night consistently? I've got some theories. So now we're going to test those theories. It's the scientific method, everybody, right? I'm going to test those theories, the doctor says, by running a series of diagnostic tests. And those diagnostic tests are basically just a formal evaluation, a formalized assessment process that gives that doctor more intelligence, more information, detailed data that they can then use to zero in on what the specific diagnosis is. And once they know what the specific diagnosis is, they can uh, form and frame a treatment plan or prescription or a procedure that might need to happen to correct the problem, to overcome the challenge, to take advantage of the opportunity. So the second step is diagnosis. Uh, Let me pause just for a second here. I I just want to reiterate to everybody that this process, even though it is, you know, very logical, and for many of you, very, very obvious. Some of you are already using you know, this process. I don't want you to dismiss it because you already know about it or because you've already internalized it. What I want to remind you of is the parallel and the metaphor of being a consultant is like a doctor. So if your sales process, if you're not having the conversion level uh, that you want. If your sales process is taking too long, uh, if there's anything going on in your sales process, you're not closing the right types of clients. It's probably because you're doing too much selling and not enough doctoring in the process. You're doing too much selling and not enough asking. You're doing too much talking and not enough asking. You're doing too much selling and not enough educating. And there is a big difference. Think about what a doctor does. A doctor, from a patient's point of view, is really just an educator. All right, I'm going to ask you these questions. This is why I'm asking. We're going to give you these these diagnostic tests. This is why we're doing these. Uh, These are my hypothesis. This is what this means. This is what this means. This is what this means. This is my treatment plan. Here's how it breaks down. I'm just educating you as a doctor. You, as an advisor and consultant, are just a doctor. So this sales process really is all about education. We have our discovery step one. We have the diagnosis step two. And now we go to step three. This is the design portion. This is where the doctor recommends a plan or a set of actions that need to be taken. And again, for a doctor, this is usually a treatment plan, uh, which consists of you know prescriptions or procedures, uh, right? Or physical therapy, right? Some, some, some combination of those types of things. Uh, and they they recommend that plan or those set of actions, those strategies, those tactics to you. And then, of course, it's up to the patient on whether or not they're compliant with those things, right? Whether or not they decide to move forward and if they're compliant or not. Same thing with your prospects you can or your clients. You can recommend a plan. You can recommend a set of actions, but it's up to them whether they execute on them or not. This is the design step of the process. And the final step of the process is the drive step of the process. This is where the doctor um, or the specialist or whoever he or she refers you to is going to, is where the work is done, right? So once a recommended plan has been accepted, then that plan is engaged with and implementation happens. Specific actions are taken. Specific pills are swallowed. The procedure is completed, right? Recovery is completed. But there's an implementation process to execute the plan that has been identified and agreed upon. And that's the drive step of this process. So I just want you to um, remember these four steps and remember this metaphor and Feel free to use these four steps as your as your sales model, as your sales process. The reality is 
there doesn't need to be a whole lot of persuasion or convincing going on to maintain control of the sales process. What really has to happen is you understanding what the steps are of your process, what the next step is for a given prospect, and making sure you're educating them along the way on what we're going to do in this step and what happens next. They can bail out anytime they want. Right? I, I don't have to go back to the doctor to, to let him or her tell me what the treatment plan is. Once they tell me the treatment plan, I don't have to engage with it. So your client can always bail out of the process. Your job is to own the mantle and role of a doctor. And that comes in mindset and it comes in how you present that process and those points of education that you're sharing with your prospect. Strategy three. The zero friction offer. We want to make it easy for prospects to become clients. So if we take this doctor metaphor and sales process we just talked about and we build in the zero friction offer, all of a sudden our conversion rates go way, way up and we're able to convert faster and easier. This is one of the biggest um, revelations that I've had in my consulting career in terms of designing uh, this zero friction offer and then refining it over time. If you're not doing something like this, um, I can't. I simply can't encourage you enough to, to try it out. Uh, you may need to adapt it a little bit for your own use, and that's fine. Um, but I have yet to see a consulting firm or an advisory practice that couldn't implement this in some specific direct way that was compelling. We want to make the first engagement, the first formalized engagement, uh, the moment when a prospect stops being a prospect and starts becoming a client, we want to make that choice of theirs almost impossible for them not to accept. In other words, this is going to be a horrible impression, so forgive me, but we want to make them an offer that, that they can't refuse, right? We want to channel our inner godfather here <laughs> and create a zero friction offer. I know Marlon Brando is rolling over in his grave, but we want to we want to create a zero friction offer that is easy for them to say yes to and very difficult on the flip side, very difficult for them to say no to. The way we do that is by leveraging a paid diagnostic process. Think about a doctor. When you go to the doctor, now whether you're paying your insurance, that's that's secondary. But does the doctor give away their diagnosis and you know some element of treatment? Do they give that away for free? No. They're getting paid for it. You should be getting paid for your diagnosis. But many, 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 many consultants and advisors, not all, but very many of them, are giving away the diagnosis. They're having the discovery session. They're sitting down with the client. They're telling them all the problems the client has and trying to convince them that they're the one to provide the solution. But the client didn't pay for the diagnostic. Think about what that means psychologically. Do we value what we don't pay for? Very rarely. Not nearly like we would something we did pay for. I'm not talking about relationships and people and that. I'm talking about business. I'm talking about buying a business thing, right? If we don't pay for it, we don't value it as much. It's just the truth. Maybe it should or shouldn't be that way, but that is the way it is. And so leveraging a paid diagnostic process will change how your prospects view you because guess what? Once they've paid you for that diagnostic, they're no longer a prospect. Once they've paid you for your professional opinion on what's really wrong and what the core of their challenge or problem or obstacle is, they're paying you as a true consultant. They're paying you for that level of expertise. And they wouldn't be paying you for the diagnosis if they didn't expect that you would have a worthy solution. Now, that's an important note. Let me say it again. They wouldn't pay you for the diagnosis if they didn't expect you'd have a worthy solution. Let's take a look at what this looks like. Developing your paid diagnostic. First of all, this is not a set of five open-ended questions that you have a conversation with and you know you charge them 500 bucks for a phone call and, and you diagnose over the phone or over a screen, uh, screen share. 
That's not what I'm talking about. This is a formalized diagnostic process, just like an MRI, right? There's the, you know, here's what it's going to be like. Here's what it's going to be like in the machine. Uh, we're going to do all these different things. We're going to deliver the reports. That is a formalized process. You want your diagnostic process to be formalized as well. And you want it to be data-driven, ideally using some sort of data-driven platform. You want to ensure that your diagnosis is uh, as, as objective as possible. It's fine to bring in your own subjective expertise because you are the expert. That's what doctors do, right? Um, they try to be as objective as they possibly can, but they know they're, you know, they know that um, diagnostic tests are going to be a lot more objective than they can be. So they run those tests. Same thing for you. You're going to be interpreting those test results through your own subjective expertise, but we want the diagnosis, it, the diagnosis and the diagnostic test itself to be as objective as possible. Next, we, your diagnostic needs to be strategic and comprehensive. We don't want it just focused on one little thing. Think about what a doctor does. Now, um, if, if you only have a problem in your knee, right, then your doctor may not be checking out your elbow. But by doing the test on the knee, he might find something else out about some other part of your body that's also important. So oftentimes, they'll do general uh, tests. And th think about the intake conversation. It's comprehensive in its nature. So your diagnostic ideally should be at the strategic level and relatively comprehensive because there might be one aspect of the organization you don't know about unless you ask about it that could affect the area that you really want to work on. So make it comprehensive as you can. You want to include all key team leaders. If, you're, if you think, oh, well, the CFO is the decision maker I need to talk to, I'm only going to deal with the CFO, you know, that's fine to a point, but... The CEO could sabotage that deal. The CTO could sabotage that deal. You know, uh, an HR director who's not on board could create resistance to you and provide, create, you know, problems or sabotage potential projects. So you want all key team leaders involved in this diagnostic. Next, you want this a process to be easily completed. We do not want to give our prospects, or now they're our clients because they're paying us for this. We do not want to give them arduous homework assignments. I've talked with so many <laughs> consultants um, that have become clients. And when we first start working together, it's amazing. Every meeting they have with a prospect or a client, they're giving them something else to do that's not necessarily easy. And it's like, no, 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 it's fine. You, you do have to expect some work to be done on the client's you know, side of things. But we don't want to. We don't want to make them push the boulder up the hill at the very beginning of our relationship, right? We want this to be easy. So what I recommend is your formalized process shouldn't take any more than two or three hours of effort from the prospect. If it takes more than that, then you know we got to find some other formalized diagnostic option. Next, you want to be able to report and make recommendations that are strategic and tactical. So uh, strategic recommendations lead to tactical conversations. So your report and recommendations, you know, can and should be at the strategic level, but they should naturally lead into action, action related, opera, opera, <laughs> easy for me to say, opera, <laughs> operational conversations. There we go. Tactical conversations, operational conversations. So start at the strategic level and then have the tactical conversation that talks about specific actions that need to be taken. If your diagnostic fulfills these things, you can see there's check boxes there on the screen. If you're checking those boxes, then you're you're doing pretty well. If you're not checking those boxes, then it might be time to revise your diagnostic a little bit. Here's the zero offer, uh, excuse me, the zero risk offer process. It's really simple. First, you establish the the value of an initial engagement. In other words, how bad does this prospect want the diagnosis and a recommended treatment plan? If they don't really care about what you're offering, about the solutions you provide, or if they don't really care about their own challenges that you're talking about with them, they're probably not going to be motivated to pull the trigger on a paid diagnostic. But they're probably also not going to be uh, motivated to pull the trigger on any kind of consulting project for that thing they don't care about. So I'm assuming you're identifying an area that they do care about. The second piece is where the magic happens, the second step of the process. You want to offer them three outcomes, uh, a refund, to stop the relationship or to continue the relationship. Let me let me just give you some of my talk track language here that I usually just share with clients, but I'm happy to, to give you here. Um, I have a process called the Accelerated Growth Blueprint. That's part of my diagnostic process. 
So let's say that you and I were having a conversation and you were my prospect um, and I was talking to you about the blueprint. Here's how I might describe it and present my zero risk offer. Uh, listen, Mr. and Mrs. Prospect, we've had a great conversation here. Based on everything we've talked about, I would recommend us going through my accelerated growth blueprint diagnostic process. Um, that's going to give you a whole lot of clarity around where you are, where you want to go, and more specifically, it's going to give you a lot of clarity on the specific strategies and tactics to get you there from a business development standpoint. Once you have that blueprint, you'll have the confidence to take the action that you need to take. Um, and the strategies that you need to, to implement to get what you want will then, as you implement them, you'll have a whole new level of control over your prospecting and marketing efforts. So obviously a diagnostic like this where we're going to spend about two or three hours, uh, I'm going to send you an evaluation that you're going to complete. We're going to spend about two or three hours on a screen share talking through your responses, um, making sure that I have complete clarity on where you are, where you want to go, and those types of things. Obviously, that type of, of engagement requires an investment. Um, but here's what's great about the investment. At the end of the blueprint process, if you're not completely happy and satisfied with the value that you've received, just let me know and I will give you 100% of your money back. I don't feel like I should be compensated if my clients aren't getting value. It's just sort of a policy and a philosophy of how I run my business. Now, I will tell you that's never happened before, um, but the guarantee remains. And if you're not satisfied, I give your money back. That's option one. The, th the second option that may happen after we finish the blueprint is that you simply take the blueprint and you decide to implement it on your own or with someone else. And that's perfectly fine, right? So my job for the accelerated growth blueprint process is just to make sure that you have clarity, confidence, and control over achieving whatever the goals and objectives are that, that we talk about. Um, after that, I'd love to keep working with you if it makes sense. Uh, but if not, that's fine too. We'll simply part and maintain, uh, you know, maintain contact with one another. The third option is if you decide to continue to work with me and you want me and my team to continue to serve you and implement the things that are in the blueprint, in which case we basically treat the blueprint as the first step of a larger project and I will apply the investment from the blueprint as a credit to that larger project. So basically what we're doing is we're breaking out the blueprint as a step one of a much larger project. And then after step one, the blueprint, we can either stop working together or we can continue working together, in which case, again, I'll credit the full investment back to a larger project where we're working to help you implement the things that we lay out in the blueprint. Is that fair? Does that make sense to you? So now the role plays over. I'm coming out of character now. That's how I set up the zero risk offer. And I hope you guys heard what was going on there. Number one, I worked in clarity, confidence, and control at the beginning because I know that's what my prospect really wants and needs. Secondly, I described the zero risk offer by saying, here's what the diagnostic is and does. And there's three possible outcomes. One, I don't do a good job and I give your money back. Two, I do a good job, but it's not a good fit or good timing for us to work together. Moving after that, that's okay. We just stop working together and we, we hopefully we'll stay friends. And then the third option is we continue working together, in which case I'll credit back the whole investment of the blueprint to a bigger project. Now, if someone is serious about their goals and objectives and we've had a good conversation up to that point, is there any logical reason? why that's not a good deal for them. No, that is a zero risk offer completely because even if they decide not to uh, work with me, they still got value for it. If they didn't get value, they get their money back. And if we, even if we do decide to work together, they still get their money back in the form of a credit toward a larger project. So that becomes a zero risk offer that it's very easy for the prospect to agree to. So now by painting your diagnostic in that way, you're increasing your conversion rate a lot higher probably because it's so easy for them to agree to that diagnostic. After that, you conduct the diagnostic, you present your recommendations, and then you engage with the client to implement unless it's just not a good fit or unless you did a bad job and they want their money back, right? But that's the zero risk offer process. It's very, very powerful, very, very simple, and very, very easy and non-threatening to offer to a prospect. Strategy four, 
you know, if you think about what we've done, what we've talked about so far, we've talked about what is it that your prospects and clients really want and need, right? Clarity, confidence, and control. Then we talked about the sales process, thinking and acting like a doctor, and we broke that process down into the four steps. And we just talked about how do we design a zero risk offer to get somebody to pull the trigger, right? To get someone to go from being a prospect to a client. Now we're backing up even further. Now we're going to talk about how do you design and fill up the prospecting pipeline? How do you identify, access, and engage new opportunities? So this is consistently the biggest common challenge that I hear from other consultants and advisors. And I talk to people all over the country and other collaborators and partners. And for most people who are consultants and whether their business is small, medium or large, it doesn't matter. Their biggest challenge is consistently getting in front of enough of the right qualified prospects. I suspect that's probably true for you too. So here's what I want you to know. <laughs> I realize it's a big challenge. I realize there's no magic pill, there's no silver bullet. I wish there was, uh, but there's not. Here's what I do know, though. Attracting prospects is not as complicated as it's made out to be. There's always somebody out there with a new shiny object, um, a new strategy, a new media channel, um, a new social media platform, right? Um, <laughs> and I'm not putting down any of those things. But what I am saying is if you're consistently distracted by the latest, greatest craze or the latest, greatest strategy or the latest, greatest social media platform, then you are going to have difficulty attracting prospects. Because at the end of the day, there are there is a foundational model that has to be completed first. And once that foundational model exists, then you can start playing around with things. You can start testing this or that or the other. But until that foundational model is clear and built and established for you as an individual and your firm, it's going to be tricky. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be a time, effort, and money suck in your business if, if it's like what I've seen in other, other firms. I love the image there on the left. I hope you appreciate it. Uh, and so many consultants, uh, when it comes to lead generation and marketing and attracting new prospects, you know, can can absolutely empathize with this. And for a long time, I could as well. You know, I'm not failing. When I make that $2,000 investment and nothing comes back from it, when I make that $10,000 investment and nothing comes back from it, when I take a half day and work on this, that, or the other thing and nothing comes from it, I'm not failing. I'm just figuring out what doesn't work. And I figured out a, a lot of what doesn't work. And that's true, actually. You know, a lot of what you're about to see in terms of the system I'm about to show you uh, came from blood, sweat, and tears. I wish it came from just sheer intelligence <laughs> and wisdom. Uh, but as so is often the case, the wisdom came from the life of hard knocks and figuring out what doesn't work. Here's what I know is true. Prospecting success is all about communicating clear, consistent value with a compelling call to action. The clearer you communicate, the more often you communicate, and the more compelling your ask is, your call to action. The more true those three things are, the more prospecting success you'll have. The better prospects will be in the pipeline, the more of them they'll be. So what I want to show you now is how you can simplify your prospecting efforts by leveraging a system that creates that consistent success. The three S words there, right, in blue. Simplify, system, success. Those are the key words. We want the success. It requires a simplified system to do that. Here it is. This is the simplified model there on the screen right now. I'm going to walk you through each of these components. Market message media metrics. You put the right versions of those things together, you will be having more meaningful conversations, which is the goal. Right When we're thinking about prospecting or marketing or lead generation, and for the sake of our conversation here, I'm going to use those terms interchangeably. They are different slightly, but for our purposes here, they're the same. Ultimately, what we're trying to get to is more meaningful conversations, right? So it begins with these four components. Who is your market? Who do you most want to have that meaningful conversation with? If you say, well, I could talk to anybody. You know, What I've got will serve the whole world. That's great that it will, but that makes your marketing job dang near impossible. Uh, it's too expensive to go after the world. <laughs> and you can't be specific enough 
um, going after the world to really attract anybody to you. So the more specific you are with your target market, uh, think in terms of demographics and geographics and psychographics, the more specific and targeted your, your market is, the easier it is to market to them. So that's step one. And I know that's, you know, that's a simple idea. Um, but the question is, look at your current target market. How could you zero in on it even more? Your message is about your value proposition, right? Why should someone work with you as opposed to any other option they have, including doing nothing or maintaining the status quo? So if you're in a commodity world, right, then, you know, that message inherently uh, wants to revolve around price usually. Who's got the best deal? Who's running the latest promotion? Um, that's not going to be an effective strategy for you as a consultant or advisor. So if you're in a commodity-based industry as a consultant or advisor, you need to shift. Not, I'm, not say, I'm not saying shift who you work with. I'm saying shift your messaging. You got to get away from talking about price and you got to get started talking about quality. You got to be the premium option. You've got to celebrate and own the fact that you're not a commodity choice in the marketplace. Ultimately, your message is about differentiation. It's about why you and not someone else. Um, it, it, it answers that question as concisely and articulately as possible. Ultimately, it's about a brand promise. What can you do for me? What results will you get for me? Part of that is what results have you gotten for other people like me? I want to see the social proof. So your message has to be a visible one, it has to be a credible one, and it has to be authoritative one. So visibility is just about putting it out into the marketplace in front of the right people. Credibility is about your achievements and your social proof, what you have done for other people. Authority is about your ability to actually demonstrate your knowledge and your skill. So how can you communicate your knowledge and your skill? How can you show your knowledge and your skill to your prospects? That is what makes up your messaging. Media, we're moving to the third component, media. This, These are the vehicles that deliver the message to the market. That's why we have a little truck there. We're delivering the message to the market. They're, they're vehicles, they're channels. There's not a right or wrong media. There are better and worse medias based on your industry, based on your target market, based on your firm, who you are. I will tell you some of the most popular media uh, and most proven to work media in our world of B2B consulting and advising, LinkedIn is fantastic. Email, of course, is good. Uh, picking up the phone, making phone calls is great. Networking in the right groups is good. Networking for networking's sake is, is a waste of time, but networking in the right groups is good. Speaking. Doing live presentations is the fastest, easiest, least expensive way to create a surge of new prospects in your pipeline. Direct introductions. Specific introductions, not referrals, uh, not where you hand out three business cards and say, if you can think of anybody, give them a business card. That's better than nothing, but I'd much rather you be asking for specific introductions. You know, your client's name is John Smith, and you ask John Smith for an introduction to Wendy Johnson, right? You want those specific introductions. So those are a few media channels that are the most effective. Ultimately, all of this needs to be tracked and you have to be monitoring and measuring your metrics to determine what is working, what is not. If you don't know what's working and you don't know what's not working, how are you ever going to improve? You can't. You can't scientifically. You might guess your way into it. You might get lucky. But you might get lucky one week and get really unlucky the next month, right? So only by measuring your metrics, you know, how effective was the strategy? How effective was this channel? How effective, you know, am I getting people out of my target market? Maybe I do need to switch markets or expand my market or narrow my market. You've got to measure your metrics. You want to do more of what works and less of what doesn't. If you do that consistently, if every 30 days you are reviewing your metrics and just making small tweaks to your, your marketing process, your prospecting process every 30 days, I can tell you in 6 to 12 months, you would have a very solid marketing strategy working for you. But if you're not measuring those metrics, at least on a 30-day basis, and you're sort of guessing or you're getting distracted by those shiny objects that are in front of you, it's going to be very, very, very difficult to break out of that and, uh, and experience the kind of success and the kind of traction that we 
you know, that you really want to have with your business development. I created a system and a model called the Authority Accelerator, and it's based on the four key components we just looked at. And I want to break this down for you um, in, a, in a simple way. This is a system that we actually help install in it, you know, advisory practices and consulting firms. So it may be something that you want to have a conversation with us about. I'm not selling this right now. I'm not even giving you the details about the system right now. That's not what this is. I'm simply labeling it, right? I'm showing you the name of what I'm about to, to share with you so that we can call it something. So this ex authority accelerator system is designed to do what it, it says. It's designed to accelerate your authority in a particular marketplace by helping you build and automate the process as much as possible. Um, and we're looking at three areas. Metrics was purposely left off the list because when we build and automate this in a systematic way, the metrics are part of that system. So we don't really need to talk about them. Um, step one is market. Again, that's the selection and confirmation of your target prospects. Messaging is the development or refinement of your core messaging. Uh, media is the setup and integration of all the different communication systems. And I'll go through some of those in a second that, that you would want to implement for your ongoing prospecting process. So when we go into a, a client and we're talking to them about um, how can they get more prospects faster and easier, we're talking with them about market selection and helping them refine that, sometimes even identifying new markets they hadn't even thought of. Um, we're working with them on their value proposition and their core messaging and their brand script, uh, trying to get clarity about what messaging is going to be most compelling to their target market and what call to action is going to get their market to respond. And then thirdly, we're helping them identify different channels, uh, different channels and technology tools they can utilize. So in terms of communication systems, LinkedIn is a key one. Email, uh, an email system is a key one. Having a communication management dashboard. Maybe that's a CRM, but most CRMs can't support the kind of system I'm thinking about. So we actually have a proprietary authority accelerator dashboard that we use that lets you manage and cultivate all your prospects in one simple place very, very quickly and easily. It's incredibly robust. There's a lot of stuff you can do on it. You may not need to do, um, but the key thing is being able to communicate, contact, and cultivate your prospects easily. Uh, another system that you should consider is a LinkedIn automation system. And we, we build all this into the Authority Accelerator, but um, you can actually automate your LinkedIn connections and your LinkedIn messaging. And so tying that in to an email system or excuse me, tying in the LinkedIn automation to the dashboard, tying in an email system to the dashboard, even tying in a texting service uh, or a phone number into the dashboard kind of gives you this massive control where you're, you're kind of the mastermind and you're able to communicate however you want to any prospect that you want any time to help move them through the process uh, to schedule a meeting with you, to have that meaningful conversation. So again, just a little bit about the Authority Accelerator. I actually want to show you what it looks like. And I don't want you to get overwhelmed by the diagram on the next screen. It's actually not that complicated. Um, so I want to show this to you, kind of show you what we build out for our prospects. Um, we use LinkedIn for, in terms of what we build out for our, for our, our clients, we use LinkedIn as the engine, as sort of the fuel in the engine. So LinkedIn search leads us to LinkedIn connection invitations, which we automate that process. And then we automate email. To some extent, we can automate phone through voicemail and texting. And we automate LinkedIn messaging. And so we've got all three of those things going on simultaneously. If our, if our consultant client has other traffic, other prospects coming in from somewhere else, we plug them into the email and phone pieces or you know, they can invite them to connect on LinkedIn too. Ultimately, those things funnel down into a prospect response. We're trying to get the prospect to respond to us in some way through a message or an opt-in page or something like that. We want them to schedule a meeting so that we can have that meaningful conversation. Once that meeting is scheduled, we obviously, you know, confirm through email, uh, sometimes through text messaging to make sure the meeting happens. But we're also pushing them into an initial assessment, that intake conversation type of assessment where they can answer some simple questions so that we can give them even more value on the prospect meeting. Um, all of this is managed with a dashboard that I didn't do an icon on the diagram here, but you can manage, you know, 99% of this process uh, from one singular dashboard that will help you set up. So at any rate, that's the Authority Accelerator. You don't have to use us to set this up. You could do this manually. You could set it up and automate it on your own in some way. The point is, this is the model. 
And you don't need to make it more complicated than this, but it does need to be systematic and it does need to be consistent. And you do need to have a source of new prospects that you're reaching into consistently. And that's why LinkedIn is so valuable as a platform, right? I mean, it's not as big as Facebook, but in the B2B space, there's not one better. It's just not. So um, be sure that you're engaged in LinkedIn and that you are identifying individuals that you can connect with and then cultivating those new connections into conversation. I'm glad you joined us for this special episode of Consulting with Authority, where I shared an archive presentation on the authority advantage with you, no doubt, and hopefully you took a lot of fantastic notes and you'll be working to implement them, but certainly reach out to me and my team if we can support your efforts or help you implement the different strategies or tactics that you learned today. And as always, for Consulting with Authority, this is Scott Cantrell wishing you the best of success. Thank you for listening. I hope you got a ton of value out of this episode. And before we go, I want to thank the sponsor of our show, Smart Solutions Media. Smart Solutions Media empowers business owners, consultants, and other independent professionals to easily attract better prospects and transform them into long-term clients. If you're a B2B consultant or service professional and would like to start filling your pipeline with better quality prospects, visit us on the web at smartsolutionsmedia.com to learn more about what we can do to help you. Be sure to complete this short two-minute accelerated growth scorecard you can find on the website and you'll receive a complimentary strategy session where we'll give you specific insights and recommendations to help you attract high-value clients. Until next time, make sure you are consulting with authority.